appreciate it. That's a pleasure. But um, obviously you you had um, dealt with a lot of bands throughout the later 70s, but then Gary came along and you were involved with the recording of The Pleasure Principle, or, or the touring principle, should I say. Right. I, um, it was post-punk when I first got involved with Gary. And during the punk era, it must have been 77, 78-ish, I was working at Rack Studios as like a T-boy. And I really, really wanted to get into some serious live work. I loved the mobile, I'd go out with the mobile. Um, and I really enjoyed what I was doing with the, uh, with the mobile unit. Mm. Now, when punk hit, none of the respected engineers at Rack wanted anything to do with it. You know, it was some pretty crap stuff. Um, sort of 10 bands a night at some scrummy little club in London. Mm. Um, and I was almost cut loose at that point. You know, you sort of know what you're doing. You get on with the, with the guys, you know, best of luck. And yeah. they, they, they cut me loose. And one of Rack's clients back then uh, was, an, was an English company called Zoe Tro it, was, it was a film company called Zoe Tro it wasn't anything to do with Scorsese Zoetrope. It was run by a guy called uh, Derek Burbage and his wife Kate. And they specialised in filming live concerts. And it really was film. It was 16 mil film back then, mm. which is quite special. And we got the call to record a Gary Newman concert at Hammersmith. And I thought, great. And I think I was working with uh, with Rack's chief engineer at that time, and we threw it to tape. I think it was 24-track analog tape. And I got on quite well with Derek and his little company there, and it transpired that, you know, could I mix it? Obviously, mm. Gary's involved. So, yes, I'd love to. And again, it was early days for me, and I had all these plans and wonderful ideas how to do this. But Gary was going to attend, and I'd never actually worked closely with a, a quite well-known artist in those days. Mm. So I was a little bit, little bit nervous about it. But what lovely bloke he came along, and we sat down, and I said, "Look, if 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 you don't mind, you know, we'll just run it a few times, and sort of each time we run it, we'll tidy up a bit more." And he said, "No, no, 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 no. We'd, we'd, I'd really like to do it song by song." I thought that's interesting, an interesting concept. And I was, I was, it was really new to me. And we did it song by song. We kind of got on. And that, I can't remember the, the, the name of the concert. I think you mentioned it. Was it the Pre Pleasure Principle? I'm not sure. It was, definitely, was it? I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure. It, but it was the, the first time. Um, anyway, uh, that got done in, in, in its own time. And subsequently, we did some more concerts with him I, and, and I really can't remember but at the time we got to Hammersmith it would have been years later we had still been in contact I'd done bits and pieces I think at his studio in in Shepparton um, and we struck up a conversation during uh, the sound check and he showed me around the whole set and I was so chuffed. You know, he, he I mean, the, the place was empty. We'd done the sound check and everything. And he showed me, you know, this is where the, this is the drummer's riser, there's the keyboards, da 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 da. We went, went around the whole stage of Hammersmith and he was kind of showed me around what happens where. And it never happened to me before. And I was really <laughs> made up, you know. Um, and the channel list that he had then, I do remember exceeded the capability of the rack mobile that had i mean it's fantastically well equipped well for the time it had an api console which are now classics mm. uh we had a couple of 24 track analog machines i think there were three m's but his input configuration exceeded what the board could take and we we had to submix particularly keyboards down to various stereo pairs to make it all fit to the 24 track tape and mm. also bearing in mind that if you're running 24 track traditionally track 24 was always a time code synchronizing signal which locked any pictures or 
the uh, subsequent machine to it. Um, track 23, 22 traditionally were a submix of, of audience mics. Mm. So you were down to 21 tracks to put an entire concert on. Um, we had to make it work. So I had to sub hire an extra console. Now remember it was one of the PA console, favorite, one of the favorites of that time, which is a Midas, a Midas something or other. And we were able to submix various elements of his show down to stereo pairs or even mono, to be honest, mm. in able to enable us to get it all onto the 24 track that we were allowed to do. It was a, it was a real learning curve. And I, I remember being a, quite excited about it and it was a challenge, but it, it worked out. Uh, subsequently, many, many years down the line, we had our own little firm called uh, Fleetwood Mobiles then. Mm. And we were based over at Bray Studios. <clears throat> I, I think I got a phone call out of the blue and I can't think who it was. Would you have a look? Would you be prepared to have a look at remixing one of the Gary Newman concerts that you recorded in Hammersmith a million years ago? So I thought, well, I don't know, you know, send the stuff over. And this, this pile of 24 track two inch tapes turned up. Mm. I thought, this is really interesting. I looked at a track split and it all came, came mulling back. So we had a bit of downtime one day. So I fired up one of the Fleetwood trucks and we had, we had MCI 24 tracks then back mm. then. And the MCI 24 track was, had a, quite a violent tape transport system where as the, the tape actually got threaded round, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot thinner than that. It's yeah. probably about the thickness of a, of a as about, about eighth inch thick pin and it would wrap right round it. And, because of the age of the tape, as soon as I press play, after seconds, it sort of ground to a halt. And this pin was scraping off the oxide right. from, from, this, from the master tape. Oh, oh, no. You know, and this is the master. There's no copy. Yeah. So sensibly, we was stopped. And a colleague of mine was able to... Um, he was familiar with the baking process. I don't know if you're aware, but if yeah, yeah. particularly old analog tapes, if they hadn't been stored correctly in the right humidity and temperature, the oxide would soften and would, would come off. And that's exactly what happened. So we took the tapes away, or he took the tapes away and went through this whole baking process. And I think it's quite, com quite complex. But anyway, it came back. And obviously the first thing you do at that stage is to make a safety copy. So yeah. we were able to copy it onto some digital format. I, I, I can't remember what it was back then, but we used that to run it from. But the, the, but the bit of oxide that came off of that master tape then, it's, we, we left that wobbly bit on the actual remix. Right. So it, and I kind of can't remember, it must've been near the beginning of the show, but it all goes a bit wobbly. Yeah. And that's where the oxide fell off the off the tape. <laughs> <laughs> but it was but it was interesting back then, you know. To, it was interesting to hear what we'd recorded back in the early eighties, wasn't it? It must have been eighty, yeah. eighty one, seventy nine, um, eighty, eighty one. Yeah, all and thrill. I must have looked at it again. It must have been late nineties. Mm. I, I can't think off the top of my head when that was. But again, I spent a bit of time on it and I could think, you know, even though I was listening to it, I wish I'd done it this way and I wish, I wish I'd done it that way. But it was really good. And it was, and it was the whole process was sort of pre-fix it days. And that's another thing we could go into. What you hear on track is actually what the band played. There was no case of, oh, we've got to tune this, we've got to replace that, we're going to overdub this, we're going to overdub that. No, what was on the tape then? was what we mixed it was it, it was interesting it's more more honest more real than a lot of things now i spend most of my time now fixing things which is really quite soul destroying but there you go <laughs> but that that's that's kind of how how i met how i met him and subsequently after those early recordings i got to work at his studio in shepparton um wasn't rock city was it was it sound city no, it was Rock City. Rock, no, it was Rock City. It was yeah. Rock City. That's Rock City, yeah. And I must have spent a year, probably well over a year there, uh, not only working 
with his material, but with other artists that he was working with. And that's where I met um, Mike Smith. Yeah. That's where I met Aid Orange. And it was good. We, we, it, it was hard work. We did a lot of stuff. I can't remember so much of it. You'll have to re remind me, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, everyone kind of got on. And I was given quite, and I know Gary and particularly the, the other producers involved with him gave me quite a free reign of, of, of what I needed to do. I mean, I'm, I'm no record producer and, you know, I've got to say whatever I, whatever I did had nothing to do with Gary's success. I mean, it was just mm. my name on the box and a bunch of guys doing what we could in the, on the studio, but they gave me a fairly free reign to, uh, to record the way I wanted to record. Obviously, if they didn't like something that I was doing, they'd say, and there was never any animosity. Mm. Um, I've got, I mean, I believe you've spoken to Mike, Mike Smith. I have, yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. must, I must track him down some. He, 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 something he said to me, and I'll, I'll never forget, and it was a bit, there's a bit of a compliment, which I, schmuck. <laughs> um, he said, he was sitting next to me, and, because I'd, I'd, I'd ponce around with things, you know, if it, if something was big and mono, I, I could make it stereo. I mean, I'd just mess around, I'd put in delays and, mm. and, tuning you know pitch pitch shifting stuff each side of the of the systems and you now mike looked at me one day and he says you know everything you do sounds sort of um uh cin cinematic i said what do you mean he said everything's really big and wide i thought i never really thought of it like that but I, that's kind of what i do it's only because i get bored with the regular stuff and i just mess around until that's a little a little more exciting yeah. um and I've, I've kind of keep, I've, I've, I kind of, I kind of do that even now, you know, it's, I'm not a purist in any sense of form when it comes to um, audio. Uh, there's, so, there's a lot of sonic purists out there, but they do a lot of orchestral work. I really admire them, even do the, the, the guys that do high-end uh, rock music. I see them putting the right mic in the right place and really going to town with it. And I really, really admire that. Mm. I used to do it when I could in, in my studio days, but even then I was always a little disappointed and I'd reach for the EQ and a, a bit of reverb and I just try and make it sound a little more exciting than it was in its natural form. Mm. I'm not knocking to say I, the, the, the people that work that way, I absolutely admire them. And some of the finest records I've got sound beautiful and i know how they're recorded they're recorded absolutely properly um and i always have difficulty doing that yeah so i kind of try and kick something into shape and somebody again and somebody else once said to me particularly because i do do a lot of live stuff and realistically they're confronted by all the wrong mics put in pretty much all the wrong positions and there's nothing you could do about it at that point and he said you spend most of your life firefighting don't you and i said kind of excuse the dog <laughs> <laughs> and firefight firefighting is you know what i do um it's not the ideal situation but when you're confronted with a concert that is going to happen anyway you can't say hang on a minute stop i want to put a different mic in the, in the right position because you know on your bike pal you know we're going to go it also um <clears throat> comes across when you listen to um the the tour and principal um tele tour and, and the wembley shows because of Wem the big sound you can actually imagine you're there you know because the sound has come across in so many different angles at you that it's almost like being there yeah if that makes That's, sense I, I, yeah it does and i i guess I guess that's something that I've developed by people moaning at me that it sounds like crap, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> and you know, let's, let's be honest. Uh, if an artist is going to make a single, let's say a three minute single, if everyone knows what they're doing, it will take about a week. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a, you, you've got a routine, you've got to practice it, you've got to rehearse it traditionally they do the backing track um which is 
bass and drums, maybe a bit of rhythm guitar and a scratch vocal. And it's overdubbed to the nth degree until you know all the component parts are there. Then spend maybe a day, sometimes two days. I have spent three days on 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 a single mix before. It's not uncommon. Mm. Um, and then you take it away or send it away for a comment. It comes back. You, you, you tweak it comes back. You tweak it again. Sorry about this. Damn, <laughs> <still>. <laughs> um, you tweak it again. And just saying, if everyone knows what they're doing and you've got a clear run, it'll take seven days, right? Yeah. So that and th at that point, you've got a very highly polished professional single that everyone's happy with, and you know it's good. Now to you take that piece of music onto a live stage. You've got to try and recreate that in three minutes. It's mm. not going to work. It is not going to work. So I've, I've made a decision a long, long time ago that I'm not going to try and emulate the record. If we do a, a live recording of anything, we're trying to capture the event. And if it's a fantastic performance, it could be a bit wobbly here and there. And, but because you've captured that live event, which is the feel, and that's what it's talking about. You hear the size of the venue. Mm. It, works and to me it works better with pictures than it doesn't in, in, in just audio i always I, I never like listening to, to live records or very rarely like listening to live records but to see it in um a television or cinema situation it's absolute magic if it's mm. done well uh and there's a lot of i won't name names but there's a couple of concerts i have seen on tv they're not recent concerts, but I've seen them recently, which are superbly recorded, superbly mixed, fixed to the nth degree, sound like the record. But mm. when you see it in context of the band playing on the stage and a huge audience and a huge venue, it doesn't work because no. you don't get this. You don't hear or feel the scale of that event. They, they've captured the music. They've fixed it the best they can, but they haven't captured the event. And that's such a big difference. I mean, I, I always look at it, I like, especially Gary's um, live stuff, because, well, especially his older stuff, because I like the rawness of everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not uh, polished up and everything. It's just the raw sound. You know, I'm sure, I'm, don't get me wrong, I know there's a, ever so much work, to, as you've just yeah. explained, to recreate that. But, I mean, it's, that's there was, what I when, like. When 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 you first contacted me about this, I had to look up some of the stuff I'd done, you know, and I did stumble across the um, uh, the Wembley concert. Yeah. Again, I think it was about eighty one. I'm not exactly it was sure. And, yeah. I, and to be honest, I totally forgotten about that one. In my head, I've only ever worked with him at Hammersmith, but Wembley, yeah. Um, and I was listening to a few tracks, and musically. They are a bit loose mm. but but there's magic in that there yeah. really is magic in it and and it reminded me of one of the things i always did like about his his style his music is that he would always have synthesizers sound like bloody great big si massive synthesizers they yeah. weren't the the buzzy stringy sounds that everyone else does you mm. know i remember and it still happens you know a, a new a new synthesizer comes on the market and you know, oh, they've got to go out and get out, get one. They cost tens of thousands of pounds. They bring it back. Oh wow, plug it in, ponce around with it for a bit, and out comes the buzzy, stringy sound again. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> and if you're going to have a sim, okay. it should sound like a sim, not not absolutely. Uh, it, you know. it was in, it was industrial. I mean, it was it was incredible. And again, I mean, I I, I try and stay away from musical comments, um, best I can, but. An observation is that most of Gary's vocal lines follow a synth part. Mm. He's not singing across the track as so many people do, which is absolutely fine. He kind of, his melodies are already in the music. And I just find that's kind of interesting in itself, you know, because it's the, great. The, the, the telly tour which would have been the second show you would have worked on, which was that Hammersmith was, again. Okay, yeah. Because the tapes for that have never been found. They had, they brought the album out, which I think has got about 10 tracks on, I could be wrong, somewhere around that. But the whole 
tape as such has just disappeared off the world. What, the master tapes? Yeah. Was it filmed? No. Just a recording? Well, they did film three, three songs. Um, I believe that was something to do at the time. You were only allowed to film three. I, I, Steve Webb told me at Beggars once, but he, even he's forgotten now. Um, do you know, I mean, seriously, do you know, was I, was I involved in that? I really can't remember. Well, you done, you, you, you must, you engineered the album. Any mixing we did was mainly done at Rack. I, there, oh, there was, there, there, there was one, there was one show that was broadcast on BBC. Yeah, that was the Wembley one. Was it really? Okay. But it was really cut down to like 45, half an hour, 45 minutes on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, okay. But you can get it, you know, on DVD or something. So. The, on, the only mixing I ever remember doing was at Rack. And I think we did some at Shepparton. Mm. I think we did some at Shepparton. So the master tapes... Is anyone phoned Rack? They've got a massive tape store there. Mm. It might be worth a contact. It might be worth a phone call. Well, um, I, if not, I, they'd be at Rock City or um, wherever his archive is. I, I don't really know. I mean, I know Beggars wanted to bring it out at one point back in the late 90s, I believe, and yeah. they had no luck finding it, so... No, no no one's asked me, but I, 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 the only tapes I've seen from back then were the ones that were brought over to um, to the Fleetwood back in the sort of late 90s. And mm. I've got to say, I can't even remember what happened to those in the end. <laughs> Maybe they all came, I really can't remember. They might have collected it. We're talking, we're talking 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, we're so, talking I mean, 40, 40, uh, we are definitely talking 40 years ago. Yeah, I, do I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time now remembering what happened last week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, after this year, I'm not surprised. That's a bit oh, hard. Oh, don't. Yeah, nightmare. nightmare but then, nightmare. but then you were involved with the Berserker tour, which was in '85. The engineering of that. Well, if you say, I, I mean, I'd never been involved with the actual tour as such, but if we recorded a show, um, yes, yes. Um, you know better than me. Where was that? Was that Hammersmith again? Uh, I know we did some stuff in Manchester. I, I believe it was Hammersmith, actually. Okay, I know that was one of his favourite venues. I mean, it, it, it still is a lovely venue. It's, it's gone a bit um, more of a comedy place now. Yeah. But yeah. Was, we were there, oh, actually about just over a year ago, one of the last things I ever did. Um, it's all got a great vibe at that place. You know, it's a lovely place. Um, but 85, that would, pro we would probably... We would probably have mixed that at his place at that point. But were you finding um, your own technology um, gathering pace? So it was becoming, as you were saying earlier, having a 24 track. Was that still a 24 track or was that moving on by then? 85. 85 would still, would still have been analog. It yeah. would still have been analog back then. Um, the technology was there to uh, to synchronize two machines to make 48 track, but it wouldn't have been done. It would have been, I've got to say, it, it was quite an expensive process. Yeah. Also, you've got to bear in mind that even back then, a 10 inch reel of 24 track tape was about 240 quid. It's, it, you know, and I think if I remember it, at 15 inches a second which was pretty much the, the standard speed for live stuff they would have lasted 20 minutes each yeah. so the actual tape cost of any live concert was phenomenal you know and if you doubled it up 48 track it's double the cost um and the i guess the um technicalities of synchronizing it for the remix it wasn't difficult to do but it really slowed the whole process down mm. because whereas when you're mixing off one tape you can just stop roll back 10 seconds and carry on on 48 track with two machines you'd stop 
have to roll back probably a minute, wait for 20 seconds while the other machine locked up with it. And then by the time you got the bit you wanted to fix, you'd probably forgotten what you wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it wasn't an easy process. Um, and I, I guess when, when digits reared their head, again, I, late, late 90s, was it? Early, early 2000s, track count became not so much of an issue. Mm. And well, the same back then, we we're trying to crowbar everything onto a 48 track tape. I dream of 48 track now. I mean, we, our recorders, I mean, the standard Maddie stream now, which is what everyone's using, a standard Maddie stream is 64 channel. And we regularly fill up two of those. So mm. to do a 128, 128 track recording is just like a normal day at the office. Oh, God. We, we've exceeded that. I mean, it's just yeah. insane. Yeah. It really is insane. If you want more tracks, more instruments, just bolt more on. It makes the remix process quite laborious because you've got to make all decisions on the mix. Whereas when we did it back then, you had to process to tape. And that was a bit of a, I guess, a, 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 a skill back then that not a lot of people do now because when you process to tape, you can't do too much. You can't screw up because once mm. it's there, it's there. The, the traditional way of recording now is to, you know, you amplify the microphone up to normal level and put just the raw signal to tape and do all the processing off tape. Yeah. Um, it's just a totally different technique, totally different technique. Because because I often think, and I, I was talking to Andy McCluskey of Orchestral Maneuvers about this ages ago, um, going back to the day of uh, eight track or 16 track. Yeah. I, I think I, I love the simplicity of all this sort of stuff. And he, he, he was saying that if someone came in and said, look, I've got this awesome synth sound I want to use. He said, well, it better be good because we're going to have to lose something else. Whereas nowadays they can just be added on, can't it? Yes. So yes. And yeah. I think the simplicity of a lot of music has been lost because they were brilliant. I, I, I do. I do agree with that. Mm. Um, however, some of the big productions that are coming out now, which would have been impossible back then, mm. are stunning. I mean, yeah. you can do, you can now do absolutely impossible things and in the right hands, it's awesome what, what, what can be achieved. But a lot of people say, oh, you've got to listen to the recordings of the 60s and they think, really, you know, there's some utter shite coming out of the sea. There's the odd, they're, they're, yeah, absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, but there are a handful of, of tracks and recordings that stand out and they're just magic. I mean, I, I, I like the old Motown stuff. Generally, there's some really good Motown stuff. Um, and actually, I think Motown was making it mainly done on, on eight track. Yeah. And it was just a bunch of musicians playing like demons mm. in a very small studio. And they're, Again, it's a bit like um, capturing the event. Yeah. You know, you're not trying to fix it. You know, if they screwed up, well, do it again. Yeah. You know, and don't screw up. Well, we'll get someone else. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But you, you um, were saying you were at Rock City for a, a good year then. Yeah. If not maybe. So you, you were not working with just Gary, but lots of other people as well. They were... Uh, um, Gary had his own record label, didn't he? Was it new? Yeah. yeah, it was new. And um, they, I know they were signing uh, various various acts. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, but I think that's where Aid Orange and uh, Mike Smith and his team came into it because they were let loose in the production role. Yeah. And because I'd, I'd kind of become a bit of a fixture there, I'd, I kind of got to work with all of them. And it was great. I I can't remember, I can't remember, I remember instances where I've got various sort of uh, snapshot flashes of what, of what and who we did, but I can't remember much, if any of the material. It was the early days of MIDI where um, everything, or the majority of instrumentation was sequenced on a computer 
and that drove the keyboard modules and the drum machines. Um, it was driving me nuts at one point, I've got to say, because it's not difficult to record the output of a computer on a jack plug. Mm. And I, it, it was probably towards the end of my time there, I, I, I woke up one morning at home, I thought, knew I had another, another day there, and I thought, you know, if, if I spend another day recording the output of a fucking computer, I might as well go and work for Sainsbury. <laughs> I <dream. laughs> you know, um, it was, it was, I, I didn't really enjoy the, the MIDI era mm. because it took away the enjoyment and the frustration of trying to record something live with real microphones and real organic people playing them. And I'd spend a bit of time on the rack, the rack mobile. And around that time, I thought, you know, I've got to get back on the road because that's, mm. I've, I've now proved that I can do it in the studio. That's what I needed to do. That's why I went into studios from, I love mobile work, but no one would take it, take, take me seriously that I could actually record properly in a studio situation. So I took the decision to try and get into studios. And it, it was around that time, again i took the decision it's time to get back on the road yeah. and i subsequently did that and back in the studios again da, 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 and i've been on the road basically for the last because you one, you actually three. engineered a couple of albums studio albums for gary didn't you you done strange charm and metal rhythm i believe i think i need to check i think i was involved but i i don't think i did all i don't i wouldn't have done all of it I think on Metal Rhythm you you were involved. Strange charm. I don't know, Steve. I'd need to look at that. I I to my knowledge, I didn't do I didn't do any album from top to bottom, but I know we did we did bits on a lot of recordings that he was working with other people on. Mm. I don't know. Well, I don't strange know. charm. Obviously, there's a track there with, with um, Bill Sharp. So um, you might have been I don't part think of that I one. Did, I don't think I did. I, I may be wrong, but I don't think I did that one. Oh. I'm, yeah. I'm, I stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I, I, I couldn't honestly put my finger on anything specific that I did for regular album work with, yeah. with, with Gary. Um, but I, I think he was working in other studios as well. Although I don't know why. <laughs> no, maybe that's maybe that's not the case. We had a lovely studio there. I, I was at I was at Shepperton on a totally different matter a couple of years ago, and I thought, well, I must go around and see if um, you know see if I can even find the old the old Rock City. Yeah. And um, it was there. I think, I, and I think it was occupied by a, a film lighting company at oh. that point. And I just looked and I thought, shall I go? And I thought, nah, you know, this, but I recognize the shape on the outside and a few, a few memories came back. But it was a lovely studio. I mean, it, it was, I've, got, I've made a, a list of, I mean, if, if, if any, <laughs> anyone's interested in knowing what he had there, we had a, it was a Trident TSM console, mm. which is classic now, be worth an absolute fortune. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, his main, uh, recorder was a Studer A80, the 24 track A80. And I think he had an, a smaller Studer A80 as a stereo two track, which is his master machine. Obviously cassette recorders coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. Might have had a DAT, I can't remember. Very limited um, outboard equipment. His main speakers, and we always used to work on the, 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 the near fields because he had some huge JBLs, which <laughs> really didn't sound that good um we used the um ar18 bx's and their acoustic research almost um domestic hi-fi speakers but they were, were powered by a quad i think of the quad 303 and they they would get loud and sound good they were great so it was it was all box standard stuff and he had a very nice live room i think he had a live piano in it he had a, a sensible selection of microphones um yeah i've got i've got the list in front of me funny enough uh, oh really so the whole excellent. 
it's actually from Rock Studios if you want to hire it or City. Yeah, Rock, Rock City. Rock City. Um, Was there a brochure? Yeah, it's £45 an hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you do under three hours. You could, you could have um, an ultimate day with the wave P, 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 oh, P, P. PG wave. That was that was Mike Smith's thing. Yeah, two two point three and operator. And six hundred pound a day. Blimey. <laughs> Blimey. But and, I, I I do remember that maintenance was a little bit lax there. I mean I could I could fix most things. I'm, I was I was quite a dab hand with a soldering iron, so you know anything that anything fairly normal I could I could fix, but it had to be pretty desperate before we ever called the man in. I mean, um, why, why is a, a Roland um, diminisher D? A Roland what? I think it says dimension. Dimension, dimension yeah. D. Yeah, that's it, dimension. Dimension D. I think that was an effects unit. Ah, right, okay. I think that was an effects unit. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you I this think like a, Yeah, I think it was like a chorus effect. Ah. My God, again, they're like... They're like gold dust these days. You could put that on the vintage lists and make a fortune with it. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've got a, I've got one horror story which I should recount as well. Um, one of Gary's regulars was Dick Morrissey as a yeah. sax player, and I mean, absolute brilliant sax player and a really really nice guy. And we we, we were going to do the the sax overdub one particular afternoon. Um, this is why the, the, the maintenance thing hit me. Um, so we, I, I think typically we'd book a, a session player for a standard session, which was three hours. That's mm. the session. So we had three hours to do these sax overdubs. Um, so off he went and we carried on doing other things. I don't know, vocal. And I remember him saying, oh, can you turn up the sax solo a bit? And I thought, oh, hang on. It's gone. I thought, oh Christ, I can't have. <laughs> the 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 studer, the A80, it had the record ready lights, weren't little LEDs, they were proper little light bulbs. Right. And I knew some of the ready could record ready bulbs had blown. Right? <laughs> so I'd left his track in record ready. So when I dropped in on someone else's track, I erased the bloody saxophone. <laughs> um yeah, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting <laughs> revelation. <laughs> but you know, hey, it wasn't really funny. But Dick came back and we did it again the other another day. But uh, yes, make sure the the red lights don't the, the red lights aren't blown. It's quite important. I mean, do you? I mean, obviously, you, you you've spent your whole life doing this sort of stuff. I mean, do you still love it as much today as you did then? Um, it's different. Uh, I, I kind of, I spent a lot of time in studios, I suppose, 80s, 90s, um, apart from, I didn't have a great many clients, uh, but I built a studio for a colleague of mine, who's a quite well-known person who didn't live a million miles from, I used to live down in Red Hill down in Surrey. Right. And um, Gary's studio was probably about 45 minute drive. And I've worked with this other guy about half an hour away near, near Croydon. I built the studio for him. And I was, again, I spent a lot of time there doing all sorts of things. Um, but I, I was still kept my foot firmly in the door of mobile recording. Rack had kind of filtered, filtered out. And I became very much involved with the Fleetwood Mobile to that time and the people mm. that ran that. And to cut a long story short, I ended up working for Fleetwood. And after a couple of years, a colleague of mine and myself, we got absolutely, we'd had beer one night and said, why don't we buy it? We, neither, of us had a, neither of us had a pot to piss in, but somehow we managed to. <laughs> 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 and um kind of been on and that that was in about 96 97 we bought the old the original fleetwood mobile mm. and totally pulled it apart and rebuilt it borrowed more money um and by the time we actually got 
on the road we were absolutely penniless and, and there was no work so it was a very interesting start so from Fleetwood we went to well that was bought by a major company called Sanctuary mm. um, that didn't work out too well so we managed to get Fleetwood back that went even worse <laughs> so for the last few years 10 years we've had our own company Red TX yeah. Um, and that's been going reasonably well, let's say, until you know, the plug was pulled about a year ago. And now yeah. God knows where it's all going. I mean, it's a nightmare for everyone. Indeed, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed my time in studios. I, I love live work now, um, particularly the particularly live on airs, because it's a, mm. there's a degree of excitement to it and in fact you've got to get it right you don't want to let anyone everyone down and it's not just the artists it's not just myself but it's all the people that you know that you're working with because yeah. they look to you to produce the goods and you know you just got to do it um and i think we're pretty good at it there's a little team of us that, 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 that are pretty good so um yeah nothing but too just, exciting just a quick one just something yeah. i suddenly thought of and i think something you might have said that going back to let's say the hammersmith shows yes um would you record a previous night or would you just record that night what i'm saying is do you, have you everything set up so you just record that one night or do you try a different night just to see how it's going generally you're only contracted to do to do the one show mm. and um you're kind of in and out in a day so you, yeah. you rock up in the morning or eight o'clock whatever you and you, you the clock's ticking as soon as you get there you know at a certain time you're going to do a line check with the pa company and at a certain time the band's going to turn up you're going to do a sound check and then you've got a time when the concert's going to start and when that time comes the concert's going to start whether you're ready or not they don't yeah. care you know so you've just got to keep up with everyone um if we do get the opportunity to get there a day before which happens quite regularly now for the you know the the, the big artists because yeah. they want to rehearse we always record it and the reason is it's the fix it culture where if something goes a little bit sideways musically or technically on show day you've got something referred back to that you can cut it in yeah so yeah. it's a belt and braces it, and it is it is used quite regularly but if we do it basically if the band are playing i've learned and I've, I've learned i've learned to press the record button yeah. because I've, I've felt flat on the face a long time ago when someone looked at me and said you did record that didn't you and i said well no so uh, from there on i thought if someone's playing you press the red button yes <laughs> whether I, you're I've ready made, or not i've made a, a, the same mistake with an interview that um i didn't press record um, <laughs> so we had to do it all again um <laughs> oh no this no this, this this shouldn't be on this interview but I, I will name the name because it was it's one of the i was quite proud of the fact afterwards but um i was working at island island studios yeah. and the, the word came does anybody want to do a session on the saturday afternoon and of course nobody wanted to go into the weekend i said i'll do it who is it and it was the um it was just before or Dexy's Midnight Runners had just had a hit, or yeah. a couple of hits. I forgot what the first one was. But anyway, Van Morrison written, written two of the songs, with Come on Eileen and the other one. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Van know. was going to come along that afternoon to do some overdubs, to overdub a guitar. And vocal. That's, what, that's what I was told. So I got there early, set it all up and it was you know fairly straightforward session um <laughs> and please forgive me this 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 li this little fat bloke with stains on his t-shirt came up carrying a guitar and a, an amp and a combo i yeah. said i'll stick it over in the corner mate I'll wait wait till the main man comes and that that was van <laughs> 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 right okay and it, and it and it gets worse um the the record producers mutt langer and win stanley was it I know, I don't know. anyway the producers came in and um explained to me that we were just going to record record uh, a vocal overdub and a guitar overdub with with van morrison to the, to the track so we set it all up and the little uh, uh, if anything goes you know if anything political 
goes on, I sort of keep away from it. But a, mm. a bit of a heavy conversation was obviously going on in the corner of the control room when Van came in. Apparently, Van was under the impression that he was booked to produce the track from scratch right. with the band. But they only wanted him to do these overdubs. So long and you know, long and tall of it, they persuaded him to go out into the live room and we set up a vocal mic and the guitar mic simultaneously. He was going <clears> to <throat> see what happened. Mm. And it was traditional really to have a, a, a quick run through just to check the levels are right and it all sounds right and the headphones were okay for him. So uh, we came to the end of the track, so let's go for it. At that point, he put his guitar back in his case and walked out. <laughs> and the producer said to me, you did record that, didn't you? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've never worked with them since. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> so I was the guy that never recorded Van Morrison. So. Yeah, what about that? <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, I can't think of anything else, anything specific. Well, no, we, we've been on about an hour, so that's good. Considering you said you had 10 minutes lined up. Uh, I, I did, actually, yeah. <laughs> I mean, coffee's, absolutely, it's coffee still warm, which is great. No, um, it's, it's, it's great. I love it. I well, it. I hope you can cut, cut, carve a couple of minutes out of this. Oh, well, okay. Um, yeah. I'll send you this. Uh, uh, you're on WhatsApp, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll send you this list I've got. You've probably got it somewhere yourself, but it's an interesting topic. Oh, is, it, is, is this the Rock City stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it'd be interesting to see that, actually, yeah. Because um, it, it, it was a... I, don't, I think I don't know how he... Got, he must have rented it because it was staffed by his dad, and and his mum. I never. What happened to John, his brother? He's um. Well, he went on to be a pilot. He wanted to do that. Did he actually? Yeah, he make did. It? He, he flew oh, good for British, on Air, British Airways quite a while, but um, no. I think he's retired. I don't. He, he's still doing music. Right. I believe. Um. Yeah. I mean, because Rob, I totally lost touch. I know he always wanted. He always wanted to. To be a pilot, that was his. Yeah, that was his ambition. I'm glad he made it. Yeah, he did, and I, I, do, I do believe I'm not. I don't follow him, but I do believe he's he's retired and um. Like they're retired. Um, they retire. I think pilots retire early, don't they? About sort of fifties or something. Yeah, I, I believe so, and I think he, he's just enjoying life, really. You Good know, he, he got married the other year, so he's happy, and um, yeah. And Gary is obviously in um. Uh, Los Angeles nowadays. So um... yeah, I um I I think I last met him or did something with him. Just I'll tell you when it was. I I had oh, what's his lady's name? Gemma. Gemma, yeah, yeah. He he they just given birth to their first. Yeah, and we were doing a concert in Manchester, and we thought we he, he's not going to be there because you know. She gave birth that morning, but no, he did turn up. And um, that was the last I, I sort of saw or heard of him, to be honest. And I mean, I met her, I think I met her in the early, time, the early days. She's a lovely lady. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many kids he's got now. Three. Has he really? Yeah. And I, I can't, one of his daughters was 14 the other day, but um, I, she's not the oldest. I can't remember how old the oldest is. I should know, but I don't know. She, Bloody terrifying how time goes, isn't it? Ah, oh, talk about it. Jesus Talk about Christ! I'm just looking so he, at some of Rock City's customers, and you, you've even got um, um, Hot Gossip, Bill, Bill Sharp, OMD, um, Sting was there, Phil Collins, Twiggy, Grand Duran. There was a there's a list of recent customers, so it says. But, um, I have no idea. Nothing to do with me. <laughs> I really wouldn't. I mean, I can't see Van Morrison though. <laughs> no, no, strange enough. No. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, the the studio kind of suited him, but yeah. the state of it, I'm surprised it attracted any any big names. I mean, it was it worked, but it was a right. I've got to say, it was a right old mess. Well, I don't know. It's got an ala carte <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> So it says, bloody well didn't. That was that was <laughs> two licensed bars. That but that no that shep that Shepperton. 
Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. Is that what that is Shepparton. There was ah. a there was a bar on site that I know Mike Smith and the self used to try and get to before it, it shut. It is Shepparton, right? sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. And there was a restaurant there. Yeah. Yeah. I was just looking um, at the, the Rock City um recent customers and then it follows on uh, underneath, but I missed a bit where it said Shepparton. But um, no, we used to send the tape off, off to get McDonald's every lunchtime if we could. <laughs> down to down to Slough, was it or wherever it was? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, uh, it's absolutely brilliant talking to you, and I, I could talk. Right, to, mate. I could talk to you all night because it's 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 fascinating stuff. Well, really, it really is a, a something we could all get together over a pint one of these one of these years. Well, I'm I'm hoping to. I I, I was hoping to try and do something in London because it seems fairly central. It's not central to me, but it's central. Um, Where are you? I'm up on the Norfolk coast. Way. No, you know in Norwich's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit further up. Oh, up there. No, yeah. Oh blimey! Oh, nice part of the world. No, I'm up, I'm up in um, uh, I'm just north of Banbury. Right. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I've moved up here. Oh, we've been up here for fifteen years now. Yeah, it's great. It's forty minutes from the office. Yeah. And um, if I so I've been there. I can't remember the last time I went there. <laughs> <laughs> here they come, here they come. I mean, and it's, you know, th this and is the main, country. this is the main thing that, you know, I think we can all see, hopefully, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, you know, for, for everything. I, I, I talk to people every day, I don't know, I was just reading today that the Isle of Wight Festival is going to happen, it ain't. I wouldn't have thought I can't. It, I know it's, end towards the end of September, a, the schools and universities have gone back, mm. uh, which is one thing against it. And if they do all the social distancing and sensible things for the festival, how are you going to get those tens of thousands of kids on the Isle of Wight ferry? I, you know, well, it, it doesn't it, make it, any sense. No, it, it goes back to anything, really, even if you've got a thousand people gathering in a, in a, a concert. It's yeah. a fact, obviously, the place can only hold a thousand people, so they're all going to be crammed in there. So I don't and, know how that's going to happen. Well, also, I mean, you know what it's like at a festival. Doesn't matter what happens, you're going to get crushed at the front. Yeah. No, nothing's going to keep them from storming the front. I, I just really, really don't. Now, we're, we're quoting for, I mean, we've had a really, really... Last year was tough, but everyone sort of muddled through and got through. And by Christmas, we thought, okay, we're on the home straight, we cracked it. Then mm. this lockdown came in January and we're all fucked. You know, yeah. I just don't know where it's going from here. But, um, oh, I forgot my train of thought here. Oh yeah, we were, we, we were asked to quote for um, a nice job in uh, November in Budapest. Right. Great. You know, done Budapest. But realistically you know do we want to borrow money to hang on till then just to be told the week before that sorry lads we're not doing it after all you know it's just insane i think just this insane. could be the problem that a lot of bands are fingers crossed trying to go on tour later this year yeah but but the whole scenario is that the government can pull the plug 24 hours before that's you know? that is one problem but also i was talking to a friend of mine i think yesterday who's his mainstay is he, he does stage work and PA and, and, and things. And he's as desperate as everybody else. And he says what he's dreading is if it's all, you know, you're allowed to do what you do. And his first job is a festival. He said, mm. and I, I mean, I know how hard work a festival is, and it really is tough on everyone. It mm. really is. And he says, he, he, he says, I don't think I'll be able to keep up. And I'm thinking they're probably the same. Mm. I, and this is it. You lose you lose the momentum of the stuff you're doing. I mean, without bragging, I mean, we, we would confidently go from one reasonably sized job to another one and confidently do it. Mm. I did a I did a job abroad, nothing to do with this firm, uh, just before Christmas. And it was a reasonably big job. It was live on air, nothing mm. too complicated. And realistically, I could have done it with my eyes shut, but I... I didn't sleep the night before worrying about it. Yeah. I thought I'm just not I'm not I'm not match fit anymore. And I think that's gonna to happen to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. And the longer it goes on, the worse it's gonna be for people. People are slowing down, and unfortunately for me, 
lethargy is setting in and the less i do at the moment the less i want to do and it's it's crazy it's crazy yeah. so you know trying to trying to find things that keep you know, keep us all heads above water we got we got a big job this week the trucks over at up in uh, down in uh, sussex at the moment on something quite nice and that'll keep us going for another couple of months yeah but it's um it's hard isn't it it's it's going to be an interesting I, I don't i don't think anyone can really honestly say they can breathe again until the end of next year 22. i i think um it seems if you really look at it without trying to get too depressed it's probably very true you know it's dreadful and i know that another big problem which the, I, the government have kicked into touch they're not going to deal with it it's a fact that if there's any live event being organized with the public the promoter can't get insurance yeah yeah and that that's a killer because that means the insurance companies are holding us all to ransom for uh things behind closed doors like the sporting events yeah uh, uh concerts with no punters yeah you can do that tv productions to get insurance but as soon as the public are involved you can't get insured in case someone catches the bug tries to short sue the promoter and all hell breaks loose i think so, as a promoter you you would you'd want to be in a very very good position to take that chance wouldn't you yeah uh, and someone says and I, I kind of agree but i don't know the legalities of it so sign a disclaimer but hmm. it must be more complex than that for them not to do it it never works that easy does it no no uh, so um who knows it, do you know it, what's gary up to do you know uh well he's got a new album out soon um obviously he had a tour lined up for last year which cancelled no i don't know did he have a tour no he was doing some one-off shows all yeah. over the place um but in, 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 he doesn't work over here does he you no know, he, he comes to uk all the time oh blimey i must look out yeah he, he was gonna do um they were trying this um drive-in concerts at one point i, I don't know That's how that works you, you go in with That's a good idea. And, but they a bit like got, a drive in movie. Yeah. Yeah. But they all got cancelled. So um I, I hopefully it goes back to what we were just saying. I mean, do you plan a con a, a tour this year? Or do you Tough. wait I, wait? I'll tell you something we did last year towards the end of last year, and it it was absolutely great. And I'm surprised no one else has taken it up. And it was big. Um again, name names. It was Liam Gallagher. Mm. he did a concert up the t being up on the thames going along the thames on this huge barge yeah um it was incredible it looked great the band loved it it was a bit of a secret no one was allowed to talk about it mm. to save people jumping off the bridges yeah but, um it was it's a great format because you, you know the 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 band pass they you know they pass by so there's no crowd sort of gathering mm. or for, for any length of time um it was a really really good format and i thought that would be a really nice sort of concert general concert format take these huge bar i mean this, these barges i thought a barge um yeah these these things can take 750 tons yeah so it had all the tv on it all that had stages had the band and the lighting it was a full-blown concert really? on the river thames amazing yeah now that i'd like to it. see yeah it's uh, it was on it's online somewhere i think when yeah. on um melody fm they put oh, it out okay and I, I saw bits of it you know, i think it's bits of it on youtube gallagher on 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 the river or something or yeah, yeah. It. really it looked really good but you know if you, if you speak to gary or see him give him my regards i mean and wish him well because i mean I if, if i saw him again we'd probably grin and nod and probably would have a great deal to talk to talk to each other about <laughs> but and you know, great always... respect for the guy it's always funny actually you can not talk to or see someone for 20 years and you carry on talking you though you spoke to him yesterday ridiculous isn't it yeah. <laughs> just and i think it, it might be longer than 20 years though that's the trouble yeah quite well <laughs> I, 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 the last album you did with him was about 88 i think so um yeah it oh. is over 20 years <laughs> yeah terrifying isn't it? but tim it's absolutely anyway, brilliant talking to you anyway. Um, and, um, well keep in touch you know what I uh, apart from this but I, I know your name i mean you've done all sorts of stuff haven't you? you 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 contribute to magazines and stuff i did i did not so much now um, <laughs> <laughs> i know that feeling yeah <laughs> well, well i used to um yeah I, 
I'd be doing live live reviews, but there's not much point at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got nothing live that. to report on. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But oh, it, no, but it's brilliant. And I, thank you ever so much. I really do appreciate your time. That's brilliant.